everyone, and welcome to the Mega Podcast. My name is Raquel Baldelamar, where I interview high achievers on how they fulfill their professional dreams while maintaining balance throughout their lives. Today, I am with Dr. Simran Singh. Simran is the Executive Director of Religion and Society Program at the Aspen Institute, and he is author of the book, The Light We Give, How Sick Wisdom Can Transform Your Life, published by Riverhead Books in 2022, an imprint of Penguin Random House. Simran is an internationally recognized scholar and human rights activist, teacher, author, and columnist with hundreds of thousands of followers across social media. In his latest book, The Light We Give, this is the book right here, read it all this weekend, it was great. Uh, In the book, he invites readers to embrace the lessons he's learned as a self-proclaimed, brown-skinned, turban-wearing, beard-loving, sports-playing dude Mm -hmm. trying to survive in modern America. He talks about the wisdom he gained from being a practicing Sikh who's trying to find common ground with others and bring a fresh perspective to how we can cultivate empathy and fight racism. Simran was born and raised in Texas, my hometown, from 10 years old, and he is the son of Indian immigrants. He graduated from Trinity University in San Antonio, then attended Harvard Divinity School and got his PhD at Columbia University. Throughout those years, Simran has confronted racism, bullying, and ethnic slurs. Yet instead of growing bitter or angry, he drew from sick teachings to seek out the good, to seek out the good in every situation and find positive ways to direct his energy. What started as a matter of survival has become a calling. Simran currently lives in New York City and is married with two children. He balances his professional life with a love of sports and is a huge San Antonio Spurs fan. Simran, welcome to the Mega Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for mentioning the Spurs. That's so important to me. How are they doing? Horribly. (laughs) Are they really? (laughs) They're They're not good right now, but they were good for about the first almost three decades of my life. So it's, I remember yeah, not in a place I grew play. up in Texas too. I grew up in Texas in Fort Worth, Texas from 10 years old until 22. when you know, when I got through college Yeah, and yeah, yeah. the Spurs were killing it while we were, while I was there. <laughs> it was so, fun. It was a fun few decades. And then now I'm sad. Now so. <laughs> living in LA, you kind of like when people, you know, mention when I say, I kind of, you know, I follow the Spurs, they look at me you're like, what, you're not a Lakers fan. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's tough territory over here. What was it like growing up in San Antonio? You know, for those who are looking at me, uh, you might imagine that my life was terrible. And and I would say, actually, it wasn't. And that's so important for me to share right off the bat that, you know, in spite of how I look and in spite of the racism that I experienced, um, my life wasn't defined by the racism that I dealt with. I mean, there were moments. Uh, they were hard. They were different from... What most of my other friends experienced, uh, but in in a lot of ways, my life was so normal. Right, mm-hmm. I had neighbors and friends and teammates and class. I mean, so happy. I have three brothers. We were outside all the time, riding mm-hmm. bikes, playing sports. I mean, very normal in a lot of ways. And then the part that I guess is interesting to a lot of people, but I never really thought it was strange, um, was the racism we dealt with daily, and yeah. that comes with. You know, in the form of looks that we got from people on the street, things people would say to us, uh, threats, you know, got pretty serious. But in in a way, it was also part of our normal lives. Like it was just you, you live it every day and you normalize it. You mentioned in an NBC interview, you said that you were the only turban family living in San Antonio at that time. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. All, in all of South Texas, actually. Really? Yeah. Really? So people really must have just... You know, you you did you feel as a young kid? You know, you you grew up. You were actually born in Texas, right? You were born in the United States. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you 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 know you you mentioned in your book about living between two worlds and never fully belonging to either as part of your parents' yeah. inherited experience. It's so funny because you know part of part of what I mentioned in that part of the book is uh, how strange it is when people tell me to go back to where I came from. I mean, it happens now still wherever I live in New York City now, I'm in LA with you today. People will still say, go back to where you came from. And I don't think they expect me to to ask them about Texas, if mm-hmm. that's what they mean. Um, but it is it is such a strange experience to grow up in this world where you feel like an insider. I mean, I felt Texan and I felt American. I mean, I was born and raised there and that's the home I knew. And yet people on the street would see me as foreign. I mean, wherever I went, I was perpetually foreign. And even today, you know, the moment I open my mouth and they hear that I have an American accent, 
people are surprised mm-hmm. right? if I can speak English. Right. People are surprised. I mean, it just happened to me yesterday on the airplane really? that someone was surprised that I spoke English. I mean, it's it's just these funny little things that reveal to you what people's assumptions are. But as a kid, especially, and even now, um, it's hard not to internalize those assumptions. Absolutely. And and you start wondering yourself, well, do I really belong here? And in some ways, I feel like the answer is yes, and it will always be yes, like this is my home. And on the other hand, given how sometimes I'm mistreated and the dangers that I face just looking the way I do in this country, I know the answer is always no at the same time. Like there's never, I mean, at least not in my imagination, it's hard to imagine a time when I will be fully accepted as an American like everyone else. And that's that's kind of a weird a weird it place is, to be. Like I'm is. from it's, here. It's and I'm like not. being in a space between two spaces. I mean, this is your home, but still, people you might consider it home, but some people say this doesn't. You know, this is not your home. Yeah, so. you know, somebody. I I do a lot of uh, facilitation around diversity and inclusion and things like that. And one of the questions I ask people is, "When was the last time you felt safe?" Mm-hmm. And describe to us what that feels like and where you are and what's the context. And someone flipped that on me recently and they were like, when was the last time you felt safe? And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I've ever really, I mean, maybe the best answer I could come up with was on a soccer field. Like when I'm playing soccer, then I'm like doing my own thing and I I forget everything else. Yeah. But, um, but I don't think I've ever really felt like I've belonged somewhere. Not, not in a true way. I mean, if I go to India, I'm I'm not from there. I'm not safe there. Like there's actually more dangers to my life there than there are here. But I'm also not safe right. here, and I don't feel like I fully belong here either. A lot of people, a lot of immigrants have that same experience, you know, no. where they don't feel like, you know, even it, what is home, you yeah. know, and, and home should be a safe, you know, the, that safe, soft landing pad. But it never was that way for you growing up. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, it, again, like my home was very comfortable growing up. Mm-hmm. My neighborhood was a safe place. Like we were out all the time. Our parents didn't know where we were. Like this was... 80s and 90s like no cell phones like you just kind of disappear for a few hours and come back so like in that sense yeah i was totally safe and i totally felt like i belonged in that small gated community like that's that was it but then the moment you step out of those bounds you're like people don't know me here people will make assumptions like there really is no safety in your book you talk about that you were you started, uh, people started calling you a terrorist at 11 years old. Hmm. How does that affect your psyche to be called a terrorist at 11 years old? Well, you know, the, the funny thing at that age is I, I didn't even know what they were saying or what they were talking. I mean, I was mm-hmm. not even in fifth grade, I think, when it first happened. Um, I mean, I, I, I knew that they meant something negative. Um I knew that it had something to do with me looking different and then making assumptions about me. Um, I think what was more offensive in in that moment actually was, um, you know, this was a soccer referee who insisted on patting down my turban. Uh, you know, assuming, I mean, he said there were weapons and bombs in there. And I, I mean, that was actually more offensive to me than what he said. And I think part of it is because people had been already at that age saying all sorts of stuff to me. But I think to, to your point about how does it affect your psyche, um, I think the challenge, especially as a young person in this country, coming from the margins and knowing that you're on the outside, right? There's no TV shows that I can look at where there are characters who look like me. There's nobody in my city who I can look up to. Uh, there's nobody on the sports teams that I watch uh, that look like me, like, it's just this incredible feeling of isolation. And I had my family, I had my brothers, like we kind of had each other's backs, but this feeling of isolation of, and I didn't learn this until later. And I think this is one of the challenges of oppression of any kind. You feel like you're just the only person who understands what you're going through. And later I realized, well, other friends with other kinds of identities or experiences, understood that same marginalization. But as a kid, it just feels so lonely to know that, or to think that no one gets you, no one will ever get you, there's no one to talk to. Like, part of the reason I never talked to my friends about it was like, 
how would they understand the challenges that I go through because their lives seem carefree and without any sort of obstacle. Right. And how do you not let that affect your psyche? I mean, it's it's one thing to get that at a, as a young ch young child, but then as you start to grow older and realize like this is, you know, I cannot let this affect me negatively because it's going to affect so, you know, so many other areas of my life. How can you try to not let those feelings of marginalization negatively affect you? Yeah, I mean it's it's hard especially especially as a kid. I mean part of part of what I think was a saving grace um was recognizing that not every instance of someone seeing me as different was malicious. And I think that's something that we've sort of fallen into today that any time we are made to feel like an outsider, we assume ill intentions on the person who's who's raising it. And I find, and I found when I was a kid too, like a lot of times it was just curiosity and people wanting to know because they're interested. And they would say, hey, why, why do you look the way you do? Why do you wear that on your head? And as a kid, it's much easier to sort of recognize that innocuous spirit of the question and, and to engage with it. But I think today, culturally, we've really shut off to that, to a place where it becomes really uncomfortable to ask questions and also to be curious in return. And so for me, part of what um, has protected me from always being frustrated with other people is recognizing the good intent, the recognizing the, the sincere curiosity and knowing that just because somebody is asking me a question doesn't mean that they hate me or that they're judging me. They're, they're a lot of times they're just interested. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I feel that interest about others too in, in their own ways. And so um, that's, that's been a really important part of what's enabled me to not get frustrated with people's questions. You've talked about humor being a way of how you disarm people and how you address people who are ignorant or racist. Um, I find humor such a great disarming tool. Mm. How do you... Do you think you're just like a naturally a funny person, <laughs> and uh, and do you or do you think it's just like did you kind of use learn to just use that as you found that really worked to just kind of like ease the tension? Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting. Like, first of all, thanks for intimating that I'm a funny person. That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think there there are two ways in which this cuts uh, in terms of dealing with difficulty. Uh, one aspect of humor is really, uh, for my own internal practice in difficult situations, which is um, in those moments when people are nasty, when it's appropriate and when it's helpful, if humor surfaces for me, like that just helps me deal with the ridiculousness of the situation. And it's not like it necessarily has to come out to somebody, but a lot of times somebody will say something super ignorant. And in my head, I could either get angry about how ignorant it is, or I can laugh about it. And, and like, that's a really simple thing that I think I developed as a yeah. young kid. And like, sometimes it would come out as like a response. And especially when I was younger and more um, volatile, <laughs> we could say, <laughs> like, it would come out like, in a snide or snarky yeah. way, right? Like somebody says something, you just say something back and it's whatever, you don't care about that person. Right. I love in the book how you talk about how you were playing basketball with you and your brothers and you like hiked up your basketball shorts up really high <laughs> to kind of look like you guys were not that good. And then like the t these people would come in and play and, they, and you just would like run circles around them. And some coach was like, man, those... Those guys, those guys don't look like ballers, but man, can they ball? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that. That's so funny. Those are, those it shows are the there's just moments. a ridiculousness of it all, but it's just such a great line. <laughs> it, it really, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I guess part of what you're describing there is just like self-entertainment. Mm -hmm. Like we're not being funny to other people, but my brothers and I are like leaning into people's stereotypes mm -hmm, and assumptions right? and just having fun with it. And like that, that was a really nice survival tactic Good. for us when we were younger. But I think the other, the other thing about humor that's actually 
strategic um, is in situations where people are being racist, sometimes you can help reveal depending on depending on their approach and what they're saying like you can reveal the inappropriate aspect or right. the inappropriate you do it in behavior. an indirect way you do it and, and it, it really <clears throat> just stops them and makes them think so much more than just trying to lecture them it's, yeah, it's exactly. such a it's such a great tool for persuasion yeah and instead of escalating a situation you can totally diffuse absolutely. it absolutely and they're like oh shit like i didn't realize yeah. i was being dumb but like no I get it. in your book you talk about in this book everyone it's 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 just amazing book the light we give how sick wisdom can transform your life but one of the great stories of the book you you talk about how you use humor is when people would say the line to you go back to where you came from you would bring out this heavy texas drawl <laughs> speaking in texas and i was like and say something like yeah i'll go back to texas you know and 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 that just like completely mess with people's heads yeah confuse the hell out of yeah. them hilarious yeah. yeah and then they would just walk away <laughs> and and even in just some other i remember there was another situation in the book where someone was um like you had made some sort of adjective or some name for yourself <clears throat> and some person was like i can't believe you let those that like let that person name himself that name oh the terminator yes, i remember the that terminator. story yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the terminator yeah, yeah. and 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 you like basically tell that story yeah well they, it was just i was at a at an event and we had to come up with nicknames and i put terminator because in the 90s that's what every six nickname was <laughs> right like we were all the terminator um but this woman went up to one of my friends who was with me and was like that's so offensive that you gave him that name he's foreign he doesn't even <laughs> understand and i was just like what the hell like you're assuming that i'm foreign again like just because of how i look so i um yeah, I, I went up to her and gave gave a little bit in a Texan accent again, yeah. um, and 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 let her know I knew what was up. Yeah, you and, gave that to yourself, <laughs> and gave that to myself, and and yeah. mostly in that moment it was like this weirdness of this experience where like, why is this woman attacking my friend? Like sometimes I'm not the only casualty of the racism, yeah. right? Like yeah. here she was going after my friend when we were just having a good. Or Normal like time, well-meaning right? people, people who are well-meaning, or they they think they're being well-meaning, but then it show that you know you you see their racism kind right, of show right, right. up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the assumptions that are baked into right. to who they think I am and where I come from. So yeah, it's, right. it's just a really funny moment that I had to share in the book because it cracked me up. No, it's very funny. <laughs> <laughs> You're very funny. You might want to consider a little bit of a side gig as a, as a sick comedian. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that would be the dream one day. <laughs> Talk, let's talk about the Sikh faith a bit. A lot, I know a lot of our viewers uh, know very little of it. I personally, you know, knew very little of it until our conversations, you know, until my research. Um, it is the fifth largest religion in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, I love the etymology of what the word Sikh means. It means, it's a Sanskrit term that means student. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a core tenant of the Sikh faith. So... To me, always bringing a student to me, it, it, it creates this sense of humility. You know, mm. I love, I actually love being wrong. I, I mean, I always ha I have this core principle that says like strong values loosely held because mm, I love that. I want to, you know, I, I have strong values. I'm opinionated, but I also love to continually learn and be wrong so that I can like change my frame of thinking. And I think having that student mentality gives you this sense of humility uh yeah, knowing that yeah. you're you're always learning it never stops i love i love that you bring that up because i think part of part of what it means to me to be a sick is to recognize that we are not the be all end all of the world and you know a lot of spiritual philosophies teach including sick philosophy um teach that uh the human ego is the root of all suffering that the reason that we are upset and have difficulty in our lives uh, is because we're so focused on ourselves and the challenges that we face. And so humility is is the antidote to that and, and being able to recognize that it isn't possible to know everything and that we are imperfect is actually in, in, in a 
maybe in an unexpected way, at least in American culture, um, it is liberating to not feel the pressure of always being right or always being perfect and just embracing our, our fallibility. I mean, embracing our humanity. And I think part of what that invites in, in a way that feels really foreign to what I see happening in the U.S. today, uh, it invites a sense of empathy for others where we are no longer holding them to a standard of perfection. And so when other people mess up, it's cool and it's fine and it's normal and it's something we can accept rather than constantly judging people for their mistakes or aspects we disagree with and so on. And so as I look at how we're falling apart as a country and how difficult it is to get along with one another, I think this this point about being humble and really embracing our own imperfection creates an opportunity for us to to seek out the best in one another too. What do you think Americans that don't identify in Sikh religion, what can they learn from the Sikh faith to improve themselves? Yeah, there's there's a lot. <laughs> there's there's a lot within I, I think spiritual philosophies across the globe that, that we could learn from. Um, one of them, and I think this is not exclusive to Sikh teachings, but it's it's certainly the foundation of Sikh teachings, um, is the starting place of how we see who we are in this world. And and maybe maybe the way to say it is that in Western philosophy, we often start with the self. Right, Descartes says, I think, mm -hmm. therefore I am. Mm -hmm. And in many spiritual traditions, we actually start with our interconnectedness. So it's not about I, it's about us, it's about we. And that third person plural approach, which is about more than the self, which is about all of us together, it just creates a different dynamic for how we see one another. And, and I think what I really love about Sikh teachings and what I think they could offer us, to, if you're asking me today, like what are the biggest challenges today and how do we deal with those? I think if we could start from this core teaching of oneness, interconnectedness, in, in our tradition we call it ikonkar, if we can begin with a place of our shared humanity, then the aspects that make us different, you know, our diversity is no longer threatening but it becomes a celebration of who we are. We, we can really come to enjoy the differences that we all inherit and that we embody uh, because they are manifestations of that oneness. This concept between of, of interconnectedness, of what you talk about, interconnectedness and selflessness, that's a big concept that you talk about as a core tenant of the Sikh faith. And I want to mirror that against the concept of individualism mm. and self-interest how do you think we can seek out interconnectedness versus focusing on our own self-interest at times mm. can, or can we do both yeah i mean i i'll be honest and say i haven't i haven't figured out the, the answer here um part of the challenge is we live in a society and in a world um that requires us to have self-interest um, to, uh, to exist, we don't, but to survive and thrive in this country, in this context, uh, self-interest is really important. And I think, you know, one of the teachings that I try and live by in Sikh philosophy is that self-interest does not mean you don't take care of yourself. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of go into this a little bit because it was really hard for me to understand this when I did, but when I got it. It sort of changed my life. Um, the teaching in Sikh philosophy is that we all have the same light. Everyone is inherently equal and divine. The hard part for me was not seeing that light in everyone else. The hard part for me was seeing it in myself. And so one of my challenges was to be humble in a context of interconnectedness, I was just constantly denigrating myself. Like I would be like, oh, I'm not as important as other people. And I thought that's what humility was. And then I came across C.S. Lewis's quote, 
uh, about humility, which really helped me. Um, he said, uh, humility is not thinking less about yourself. It's about thinking of yourself less. Mm -hmm. And, and that moved me from an approach of self-deprecation, right? Saying that I'm not as good as everyone to saying, oh, I'm as good as everyone, but actually I'm not any better than anyone either. In our tradition, our founder, Guru Nanak says, um, he says it in this way. He says, Ham nahi change, bura nahi goi. I'm not good, but also no one else is bad. Like we're all just, we're all just even. And I think that outlook, both from C.S. Lewis and from Guru Nanak, um, helped me get to this point that overrides our cultural norms of hierarchy and supremacy, where we're constantly trying to say who's better and who's worse. And from C.S. Lewis and from Guru Nanak, the point is actually, that's the wrong question, right? Get out of that mode of thinking and really find an evenness to your life. And I think it's when I started to uncover that aspect, I really started to understand what it means to balance the self-interest alongside the selflessness, right? The, the ultimate point is it's all even. And if you can learn to live that way, then you can find that equipoise in your life. A life principle of mine is that life is competition. Life is a jungle. The Darwinian principle of survival of, a, of the fittest applies in so many different areas of life. So the, you know, balancing that tension of like the interconnectedness with self-interest really is, is, you know, is a struggle, I think, for a lot of people, you know, who want to be interconnected, but also know they have to focus on themselves to survive and thrive. Mm. Yeah, it's so funny. You know, I have these young kids, a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and sometimes trying to figure out how to understand these, what we make really complicated ideas is most effective when you can distill it for your for your kids. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm taking what you're saying and mm -hmm. thinking about, oh, well, how would I talk to my kids about this? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, what you're describing is true and also what I'm describing is true and there, there's a tension here. And so how do you, how do you live in that tension? Like, how do you find the balance? And, and I think part of the answer is understanding that ambition is not a bad thing, um, that competition is not a bad thing, um, but not doing it in a way where anyone is seen as better or worse, where there's any sort of dehumanization involved in the process. And so what does that look like? I think when I talk to my four-year-old, I mean, it's really simple, right? It's do your best. You do your best with what you have and, and you make good of what you can. And, and I think that to me is what survival looks like. I think that's what competition looks like. I think that's what ambition is when it's brought in a healthy way. I think when it's unhealthy, it's what we see today, which is hierarchy, supremacy, imperialism, take down so you can go up, right? That's what we see a lot of. And where does capitalism fit in within the Sikh faith? Can you have ethical capitalism in the Sikh faith? It's not something we talk about specifically in our tradition. I mean, there's no rules on it. I, I think there are traditions we have that essentially say a system in which some people get advantage while others are disadvantaged uh, is, un, is unethical, is unfair, is inequitable. Uh, and so it doesn't really jive with the principles of Sikh philosophy. Um, I, I, that doesn't mean that Sikhs don't make it work for them. Plenty of them do. Uh, I live in a capitalist society. I participate as much as anyone. So like these are like the, I don't know, paradoxes or the conflicts that, that we all live into, um, the contradictions that inhabit us all. Um, but But part of what I would say is if, if I, as a Sikh, was to, to design a system um, based on my understanding of Sikh teachings, it would look very different from what we have today because it would not be producing such inequities, which I don't think are consistent with our values. Let's talk about what that system would look like. Oh, man. <laughs> It's a, you know, it's a heavy you, question. You did a uh, <laughs> you did a whole dissertation on like on you know in at uh, Harvard Divinity School in Columbia on like early Sikh texts, yeah, and social justice actually. Yeah, thank you. I mean, so, it's it's so cool that you 
have done the research. So um, thanks for being the one person in the world who's read my dissertation <laughs> or at least knows of it. Um, yeah, you know, part of what, what I think about a lot, and, and maybe I can't design an economic system for the world that's inspired by sick philosophy, what I, what I can say is what I learned through my research and, and also through my attempts to live as a sick, um, what feels really different about this tradition that I find really attractive is that it it offers us a model that insists that we work on ourselves internally, spiritually, and work to cultivate our ethical selves while also insisting that we work on the world externally so through service and justice. And that to be a true Sikh, we use this term San Sipai, a saint soldier, uh, and every Sikh is expected to live as a saint soldier. And that means you try to be a saint, and then you're also out serving the world at the same time. And you, you can never take those things apart. That's beautiful. So on one hand, you're a saint, and on another hand, you're a soldier. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's an idea that comes up in so many different ways in our tradition. We have a lot of vocabulary around it, but the, the essence of it is yeah. really simple. And again, like the way that I talk to my girls about it is you be the best person you can be and you take whatever privileges you have and you serve the people around you mm -hmm. so that they can have less suffering and have more happiness. It's super simple, but it's such a profound way it to really live your is. life. It really is. And how would you say that the Sikh faith relates to the so you, you wrote about social justice and Sikh faith, you know, years ago, way before the Black Lives Matter movement mm. you know, happened. How do you see parallels of what you wrote now, what's happening with social justice in a post-George Floyd world? Yeah, I mean, there, there are two things I'd want to say here. I mean, I think one is what, what I learned through Sikh philosophy, if you take this core principle of oneness, mm -hmm. ikonkara as we call mm -hmm. it, and you extend it out, what then happens, or in, 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 a, in an ideal case would happen, is that you, that feeling of oneness translates into a love for the world because you feel connected to it. And that love moves you into action and that service. And this is what Cornell West means uh, when he says justice is what love looks like in public. Like it's just mm -hmm. this natural progression from a sense of connectedness to love to service. And I love that model. Like it's for me been an answer to the question of how do you defend against burnout in activism, right? Like yeah. we're all frustrated, we're all outraged, we're all angry. But if that's our only fuel for dealing with the problems of the world, like we can only last so long. But love as the source provides something different and it's more sustainable and nourishing and long lasting. And so that's that's part of what I'm seeing from my tradition that I would love to bring forward into this context right now, which is to say, like, yes, keep fighting against injustice. If you can infuse love into your activism, yeah. that could change the game. Yeah, you talk about in the book using love to fight hate. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what part of what you, you think can be done. Yeah, and you know, my experiences, and, and this is something I've learned through dealing with the hate that comes my way through racism, mm -hmm. it's not just about how we can help make the world a better place. It's also a spiritual practice that helps us reduce our own ego. Um, if we can break the cycle of hate externally, wonderful, beautiful. And also we can do that internally so that we're not always feeling frustrated and angry and outraged. Like just imagine if we could transform those feelings into something positive so that every day when we're walking around and seeing people, we're not assuming the worst about them, but we're actually assuming the best. That only comes with a spirit of love at the core. Right. It's not always just like looking at the worst in people or going back to what you're saying. Like some people just are, they don't know and, and they're asking questions. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, there is, you talk about in the book there that, you can either ignore or agitate in mm -hmm. dealing with racism. And ignoring is an easy way 
bit agitating is the other side of it, and, and especially fighting aggressive racism. So, you know, when you talk about interconnectedness and love and all of this ways to fight racism, when do you need to go to the other side of using, you know, fighting aggression with aggression? Yeah, I, I appreciate, you know, a lot of, a lot of people struggle with this and, and I have too, and I still do. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to go back to, to dad mode for a second. Okay. You know, my, my kids mess up mm -hmm. and in a lot of instances, in most instances at their young age, the way to deal with their mistakes is to show them affection and love and work through it with them. But there are also some instances where when they mess up, they need consequences. They need to hold them accountable. And that accountability is actually what helps them grow. And I'm not putting them in timeout for withholding their dessert because I'm angry. I'm, I'm doing it out of love because I want them to learn. And I think that model is actually something we all know and we can learn to apply to situations of difficulty, right? There is a way to use force in context when it's necessary uh, that is actually inspired by love, a love for humanity, love for the person that you're actually holding accountable. And it doesn't have to be nasty and it doesn't have to be hateful. It can be love inspired with the inspiration that I wanna make this person better, I wanna make this world better. And so that to me is the way that I try and think about those, di those really difficult moments where I want to stay strong, where I want to hold my ground, um, and, I, and I want to hold someone accountable. Uh, but, it, but it requires some real clarity of what that looks like. And it also just requires you to be very emotionally centered too, and not, mm -hmm. I mean, because when you're attacked, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's very easy to just you know, use your emotional, you know, you just use your emotions to try to attack. So it requires understanding when do I use love? When do I, you know, try to just use humor versus when do I need to really hold someone accountable in a serious way? Yeah. I love that you say that because it, you're just reminding me of when I was a kid, I would get so angry when people would say stuff to me. I mean, they'd say something racist and I would be, I would take it so personally mm -hmm. and I'd be like, what, what did I do right. wrong? And part of what I learned is actually, it's not personal. Like I didn't do anything wrong in most cases when people are being racist. And and to take the personal out of those attacks is enabled me to, to take the emotion, the emotional response mm -hmm. out of those attacks. And that is the calm that's required to be able to, in those situations, have a clear head about how am I going to deal with this in a way that orients us towards justice as opposed to more anger and difficulty. Yeah. I mean, and it's it's the idea of like the intellectual concepts of what it means to be a sick, what it means to have these sick values versus dealing in the real world and just this chaos yeah. and jungle of the world and people who have no desire to follow any of those practices but how do you engage with them in a way that is that that stays true to who you are as a person mm -hmm. exactly exactly for me meditation has always been a big part of my life and it's a way that i i think of meditation as like a way for achieving equanimity in my life and you know a way of dealing with just all of the chaos of the world um, so I try to meditate every day for, you know, at least 30 minutes. And that to me gives me that, that sense of equi equilibrium mm -hmm. so that I can mm -hmm. go and, you know, at every, you know, whatever moment, whatever's happening, I can choose how do I want to deal with this, whether I need to deal with it in a, you know, soft, humorous way, or I need to be a little bit more aggressive, pushy way, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, um, that has helped me. What would you say has helped you try to get to that state of mind? And is there anything in the sick teachings that you you can learn from, the reader people can learn from, so that they can come to the world, you know, in a state of equanimity? Yeah. Yeah. There, so there's there, there's a lot that I could offer from from sick teachings, not not just my own, but I'll say 
you know, to your point about meditation, um, I believe that each person has their own mechanisms and we can develop them. And, and what I'll share is for me, the biggest source of balance actually comes from running. Running. Yeah. Really? And, yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. you know, I live in New York city. Uh -huh. it's, I work, I have young kids. How often do you run? Uh, pretty much daily. Really? I mean, it, How many miles? Um, I try and do at least three or four That's every great. day and then I love sometimes that. more, but how, it's, like what many how, minute miles do you do? Uh, now, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm slow. I'm like nine minutes. That's great. Yeah. yeah That's yeah. wonderful. I'm a nine minute mile too. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So we should I go love, for a run sometime. Running. Yeah. But it, it's like, okay. So you'll understand because you live in LA yeah. and you have a similar experience. Like life is hectic. Yes. There's yes. always something going on and Movement. yeah, like 30 minutes out of the house and just like in my own headspace. Mm -hmm. Um, and usually without headphones or music, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll bring them along. But really? Like, so you use it without music. You, you, you like running without music nowadays, like since the kids were born. Really? Yeah. 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 That's my, like, don't, don't let anything disturb nice. uh, or distract me. Um, but it is, it is to, to your point, like similar to, it's like meditative for mm -hmm. me where it's an escape from the busyness and a time for me to just connect with myself, find calm. And I'll, I'll tell you, I just feel so connected and calm when I finish my run. Mm -hmm, um, and yeah. then, you know, the busyness starts again. So I'm not, you know, pretending like everything's perfect, but it, it creates the conditions I think for. It's huge. For just balance. Yeah, as, no, as I, I totally work. agree. And as a runner too, you can totally appreciate that runner's high, you know, it's like yeah. nature's drug that, yeah. you know, the nature's <laughs> drug that you can only get from running. And I absolutely love it. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I think of it of running as like just a defrag for my brain, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it really, nice it's, it. it's a great way of just clearing out, you know, just, I don't even think about anything. It just, you don't, you know, you don't think about anything, but you just run and yeah, it's wonderful. Same. That's interesting. So when you, you don't use music though, I use music because music kind of helps me just get to that flow state without it depends on on the type of running like okay. when i'm training for marathons and it's a super long oh, so run. you do even marathons that's really I do marathons too. Wow, yeah 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 exactly how so, many marathons have you done um six wow. i think seven yeah really? maybe something like that yeah i haven't done one in a few years since the second daughter was born and i signed up for a marathon <laughs> this year so I'll, i'm i'm in the, training the, now is it the new york marathon the new york yeah that's great yeah, yeah it's very fun well that is a great way of just like your way of uh I think I I think that's great. Meditation and physical exercise is is so important. Yeah, and I'll say you know to take it back to your question, that's also part of the sick philosophy mm -hmm. that like your mind is not disconnected from your body is mm -hmm. not disconnected from your heart, and so physical practice is actually really important to living in this world. Like your body is your container. And yeah, you got to take care of it. So I I, I do I do find that to be a nice connection in, in terms of practice. So you're a father now, mm. two kids. Mm -hmm. How old are they? Uh, four and almost seven. Four and seven. They're both girls? Both girls. Oh, that's great. Yeah, they're good kids. They're, it's scary in this world. Um, but the one of the scary things I'll, I'll share with you that I've been thinking about the last couple of weeks, my four-year-old is starting kindergarten next year. Uh -huh. And so I'm going down the slippery slope in my head of, well, if she's in kindergarten, she may as well be in middle school. Then she's going to be in high school. She's off to college. I've <laughs> yes, already lost her. Exactly. So, so I'm already sad about it. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to start dating exactly, at some point. Exactly. And you're, yeah. You're like, oh my goodness, I don't want. <laughs> you want to know about these things? How do you, knowing what you went through, like let's you know, you went through as an 11 year old, and you know, being mm. called a terrorist at 11 years old, like, mm. and seeing now being a father to these young girls that you have what are you trying to do something to help them navigate the world? You know, when they encounter racism, they encounter struggles. Is there anything you're trying to do to teach them so that they have that sense of self that's very strong at a very young age when mm. people try to knock them down? Because I'm sure that, you know, that happened to you a lot. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. My wife and I talk about this a lot and, there, there are many um, aspects, you know, part of it is we want to teach them our culture, mm -hmm. um, our language, our tradition. And so we're very intentional about that. But in, in terms of what's most important, it's actually equipping them with 
the frameworks and the values so that they're ready to meet each moment. And it's it's hard at this age, right? They're so young. Mm -hmm. Like, what is it? But also that feels like a real opportunity to create a strong foundation. And so I'll tell you one of one of the one of the things I've been thinking about recently as a parent is how do I give to my kids what I struggled with at that age? And that is to be confident in who you are as a person, knowing that other people see something very different, right? Like in my head growing up, I was American. I also saw myself as somebody who was loving, caring, progressive. I mean, like mm -hmm. all these things that define me and people would see my turban and be like, oh, that guy's closed-minded and misogynistic and, and whatever homophobic, like whatever assumptions mm -hmm. they would have. So it was so weird to live in this world where I saw myself one way and people saw me very differently. But I know all of us deal with that in some way and my girls will deal with that too. And so how do you instill the confidence in kids so that they're not so wrapped up in other people's perceptions of them? They don't feel like they need external validation to feel their own self-worth. And so that that's something that my wife and I have been talking about uh, as, as really important for, especially for girls growing up here. Yeah. And do you talk about that in a way of like letting them know, listen, people are going to say mean things about you. Maybe, you know, for a boy, it's a turban, you mm -hmm. know, for mm -hmm. a young sick girl, what would that be? Is there something comparable where people would say something mean about oh, their brown skin or? Yeah, it's that. I mean, the, the sad thing about kids is they'll find anything oh, exactly. <laughs> to pick yeah. on. I mean, that's yeah. true for anything adults Anything that's too. different, you know. Anything that's different. And so th there are a few interesting things we've been talking to them about recently. One is um, just because somebody says something that doesn't make it true. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's, you know, a very basic concept for kids to recognize truth and falsehood um but also this comes true in like understanding right. personal character as well and the, the other part of it is and this has been a really big one for us um instilling in them that you know in your heart who you are yeah and and trying to live into that and so we'll actually have language for them and, and try and reinforce for them is that is that who you are in your heart is that what makes you happy is that what makes your heart happy um and that's i mean i think that's in some ways particular to this question of helping people including ourselves see who we truly are and find authenticity uh, but it's also a real i mean for me it's become a tool for asking myself when i is my behavior matching up with who i aspire to be mm. and we, we all have these gaps i mean it's part of what makes us human uh, but it's been funny and annoying <laughs> teaching this to them has also made me push myself uh, in, in ways that I hadn't before. Yeah, and it's also, you know, re reminding them that even when, you know, teachers, people of authority tell them something that, you know, someone they respect, someone, an adult tells you things that they must, you know, you must think, you must think oh, well, that's true mm -hmm. when it's mm -hmm. not. And I remember a passage in your book, you talked about how there was, you were playing soccer and like some coach said, he can't play. Tell me somewhere where he can't play. I mean, so some position authority was saying you can't play because you're wearing a turban. And mm. and uh, I love this. I love the story of like a, a coach from your team. Actually, he said, "Show me in writing where he can play." Yeah, and he, and he just took out he, the whiteboard yeah, and wrote, "He can play." He can yeah, play. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I love to see that. But it also, you know, if that hadn't happened, if he, you know, he wouldn't have. He didn't stand up you know, to be told as a young kid that you can't play, you must, you know, it must get ingrained in your head. You know, it just, it gets beaten down so many times. So yeah, you, it's such a good point. I mean, I hadn't thought about it this way, but I but I really like what you're saying. It's it's almost um, giving, giving people the confidence to live into resistance, Yeah. right? Like there, there are things in my life where I've been clear about my principles, even at a young mm -hmm. age, right? Like kids know what their values are. Um, and, and I've been challenged by authority figures and, and it's not to say like somebody was coming in and being like, go do this hateful thing, but like things that they didn't necessarily realize were real challenges to mm -hmm. what I found to be important. Um, and, and feeling empowered to stand up and know that if I 
if I was clear about what those were, then the people around me who knew me, including my family, including my friends, would have right. my back. And like, how are you teaching your daughters to fight resistance, fight like the aggressive forms of racism? Are you teaching them to fight resistance? We, we are. Um, it's, you know, the way I think about it as, as I think about any kind of education and especially parenting is uh, scaffolding. So start with aspects that are age appropriate, give them mm -hmm. real senses of how the world is without overdoing it, without you know, overwhelming them, um, but being honest about it. I mean, that's really, I think that's really important. Uh, we talk a lot about unfairness in our house mm -hmm. and not as in um, whining about something's not fair to me because I didn't get enough ice cream or whatever. It's, it's more like, what, what do we get to have that other people don't get to have? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a way of talking about privilege mm -hmm. um, and, and thinking about, well, if we get to have those things and other people don't, why? Where does that come from? And also what is our responsibility to them. And I think that opens up a different kind of conversation that's not overly focused on politics or politicized sort of language. Um, but then now my seven-year-old is starting to make observations around what kinds of people get to have things that other people don't get to have. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're sort of easing into that as she's ready. The other, the other thing that I think is super interesting in this regard is that, you know, the science tells us that kids are noticing race from a from the six months old. And so they are already, it's not that they have judgments about race, but they're noticing skin color at that age. And they're starting to demonstrate preferences really soon after that. And so part of what is really important to me is to, A, um, instill in my kids that there is no hierarchy on the basis of race um, and, and to ensure that they understand the sort of equality in everyone. And, and the way we talk about it is that God lives in everyone equally. Mm -hmm. God is in everyone's heart. Um, but then to build from there, now we're starting to talk about how some people don't get to have things on the basis of their race. And again, this is sort of tied to what I was just saying. My, my older daughter is noticing that and that's creating conversations around racism and racial injustice. Right. And I mean, it's something you see a lot in these small, constant, nonviolent aggressions. You, you know, you'd mentioned it even like at, you know, TSA, going through TSA checkout lines, just the constant nonviolent aggressions can, it can really demoralize a person. It can, it's almost mm -hmm. dehumanizing in a sense. And how can you try to address that in a way that is, that that matches the nonviolent aggression on their part, but do it in a way that's loving. And and how do you teach people from a young age to adults on how to do that when, let's say, another brown skin turban wearing young man is constantly, you know, is going through TSA, is constantly mm -hmm. being checked on. It must create this sense of just loss of morale, loss of just the burnout yeah. too. Yeah. And and then almost like, is there something wrong with me? Even though that person might not think that, it's just, it's that constant nonviolent aggression can be really hard on someone. So. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I mean, there's, there's three different ways I could think about the TSA piece, right? Like the personal impact on me, Mm -hmm. um, and how frustrating it is, how embarrassing it is, what it signals to me about being a second class citizen in this country. Um, then there's the systemic level, like what is my responsibility to change the system so that we have fair treatment for people mm -hmm. who are different. But now one of the things I think about when I travel with my kids is what kinds of signals are they getting when they're watching me be racially profiled? And, you know, on the one hand, it creates opportunities for conversation. They'll ask, and they do, um, why do you have to go in that other line? What are they doing? Why you? Why, no, why not anyone else? Like, so, so it creates mm -hmm. opportunities for conversation. Uh, but it's also um, very painful to realize that the signals that my daughters are getting about their dad is actually going to create distance. Like they're going to be embarrassed of me or to be with me one day. And I 
I hate that. Like, I don't know how to deal with that. I try not to think about it, but that's a tough one to live with that my own government is creating systems that's going to make my kids ashamed of their dad. Like, that's hard. Yeah. And it happens with so many families. So, so many families, so many on families all di- for all you know, different reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You see that, and it's, you know, I, I haven't, I don't even know how to address it. I mean, it, it's such a hard, when it's the you know, it's systems mm-hmm. that, you know, mm-hmm. are bringing that. And, you know, I, I remember seeing a post that you had posted on Instagram about a, how a family, you know, had a, a family of young boys, a sick family had young boys who were writing, you know, they wanted to ride a helmet they wanted they wanted to ride a bicycle Mm -hmm. but they couldn't have a helmet to um you know that fit their head i mean and i look at that as like just almost like as a form of institutional racism where like Mm -hmm. the the helmet industry doesn't have secure fitting helmets for young kids riding bicycles yeah yeah it's interesting i mean it it is there, there are so many ways in which what we have considered normative for so long in this country leaves out all sorts of people. And in this particular example you're giving, um, it's boys who wear turbans, Mm -hmm. but there are so many other ways in which I or people I know have been excluded, not necessarily intentionally. Like it's just that nobody's Nobody's thinking about us, right? And you know, there are, there are rules. Like when I was growing up, for example, my older brother had to sit out a whole year of high school basketball because he wore a turban. Really, I I had to petition the United States Soccer Federation to be able to play. I had to carry around a waiver. Like I don't think people are sitting around making rules saying how do we keep X Y Z people from playing this sport. Like Mm -hmm. it's not that. But I I think what really happens is when those people are making the rules, they're not accounting for the diversity that is all around our country, and they effectively leave people out. They don't intend to hurt people, but it's really hurtful. To, to I just, out. I mean, the way I look at it is like I, I grew up in Bolivia the first 10 years of my life. Then I, you know, came to the United States with my mom, was raised by a single mom for, you know, from me and my four younger brothers. So I learned very early on that it's like I was just like, I just have to fight harder than everybody else. Yeah, 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 totally. You know, I just have to fight harder. And if I want, you know, anything, I have to do it for myself. So I had to develop this like self reliance at a very, very young age. Yeah. And fortunately, I was, um, you know, I had loving mother, I had loving grandparents. Um, I had, you know, I, I was. I had a loving home where I could develop that sense. I had that sense of self-confidence. I could go out in the world and basically fight for what I thought was right. Not everybody has that luxury of like a safe home environment to do right. that. And it sounds right. like you did. It sounds like you actually also had a really loving home to to be able to fight the injustice. I did. And I had, I mean, a lot of advantages and privileges, even though I had some disadvantages and, and I think that's true for a lot of us but to your point and and this is I spent a lot of time thinking on this and I, I don't know if I have a solution but just because you and I have been able to come out and fight with that spirit for ourselves and for the people we care about that doesn't make that doesn't make it fair it doesn't and it doesn't make yeah. the system fair and so like how do we change right. that so my kids don't have to do what I did or what others have done. And so it's, it's, I think about it a lot for my kids, but like, how do we change these conditions ultimately? And so that you don't have to always, because like, that makes you tired. I mean, then when you have to fight injustice and racism or, you know, something else, it's, it's it just that energy gets expended. So you don't have energy to focus so much on something else that might right, be really important right. to you. Yeah. And the other question is what, what if we could just enjoy life? Like that, right, wouldn't right. that be great? So, um, yeah, no, and, and not have to worry about it's, some of these other life, aspects. You know, you should be able to enjoy life. I mean, that's yeah. is a right for everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, speaking of enjoying life, how are you and your wife enjoying parenthood while also maintaining just your own, just coupleship relationship as oh, a couple? Thanks for asking. Um, so, what you should know is my wife is way smarter than me. <laughs> So <laughs> you picked so, a good wife then. <laughs> well, not You're really. Smart. I lose. I we've been married like 15 years. I haven't won an argument ever. 
So <laughs> I mean, I think I remember you met her in Boston, right? I met her in Boston. Right, right. Yeah, when yeah, you were yeah. studying in Boston. Yeah. You know, our our kids are still at an age where they like us. So mm -hmm. we, and they're, and they're super cute. So mm -hmm. we do a lot of family stuff together. That's, That's, so you've been married 15 years, you said? Um, yeah, 15, I think okay, it is. Okay, great. Going on 16. Uh-huh, so, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot of kids stuff these days. I think um, because they were so young during the pandemic, we got super attached to them. Oh, good. In like a good way. I, I recognize it's unhealthy. Um, but I also am like, well. Enjoy it now. Exactly. Because you know, once like, they oh. get 14, 15, <laughs> we're going to spend more time with our friends exactly. and boys. And That's all. what it is. <laughs> like, I know I'm attached. I'll let it go when they want to let me go. Exactly. So, Enjoy but it's it. it's fun. Um, and then the other thing that we... I mean, we, we're both readers, so we, mm -hmm. we like reading together. Uh, we're both sports fans, so she'll do she'll watch sports with me. Mm -hmm. um, although we have different football teams, so we butt heads on that one. But aside from that, we're good. What's your football team and what's hers? Um, Cowboys from Texas. Oh, of course. Yeah, and of she's course. from Buffalo, so she's oh, a big okay. girls fan. Um, <laughs> oh, they just got out, right? They just got out. Yeah. We went. We went to Buffalo. We drove to Buffalo with the kids. <laughs> you did great. Stood in the cold. It was ridiculous, um, but it's fun. Um, and the other thing we've like since the pandemic has eased up a bit, we've been going to a lot of shows in New York again. Nice. So and before it would be just the two of us, but now we get to take the kids to opera and ballet and Broadway and all that. So that's really fun. Do Sports you games. make time for just the two of you? Um, you know, or do you is it always the you and the kids? No. We do, but it's very hard. Like yeah. rarely. We we say every week we'll say we'll do it once a week. And um it effectively it... is like once a month. Once a month, so okay. We enjoy it when we do it, but <laughs> yeah, time is hard. Yeah. Yeah. With having kids. Do you have family members nearby at all? We or... have some. That's yeah. nice yeah, yeah, that yeah, you so can that nice. can help with that. Yeah. Well, yeah. We we tend to like with the family, we'll just hang out all together instead nice. of using them to as babysitters. Oh, okay, so. <laughs> good. Well, that's nice. Yeah. So what do you think is the secret to like a happy marriage, being married for 15 years? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, let her win every argument. <laughs> I don't let her. She, she just crushes she just me. It. Yeah, exactly. And every time I'm like, damn, I should have thought of that. <laughs> um, what is it? I, I don't know what the secret is. I mean, I think... Um, yeah, no, nothing secret, probably. It's just like maintaining like effort. I think yeah. effort is putting underrated. in the work, really. Yeah, putting in the work. For, so how do you make effort? Would you say? Do you, do you try to be romantic? Do you try to like do things for her? And what does she try to do? Everything. For you? I mean, I feel like there's so much effort for both really? of us. Like really? I, maybe it's how old our kids are, but it's like, um, I mean, I guess it's like the thoughtfulness behind effort. So yeah. like, what, what is Maybe this isn't the best way to think about it, but this is this has been driving a lot of my behavior recently. What could I do? What could I take care of that she that would free her up so she wouldn't have to take care of it? That's and like nice. it's almost backwards, but it's like, you know, kids go to bed, dishes aren't done. Mm -hmm. Like in my head, I'm like, oh, if I don't do this, then she's gonna get stuck. And so let me free her up so she can enjoy nice. her evening and I'll knock out the dishes, things like that. So it's super simple. Um, but I find that when we are doing that for one another, then then we're actually feeling the care. Like, yeah. oh, they're thinking about me and they're being considerate and they want me to enjoy or whatever Those acts is, of so. service are really important. Yeah. And they can be tiny. Like mm -hmm. doing the dishes is, what, five minutes? Yeah. But yeah, it goes a long way. But I also think having like shared common values, like, you know, you both like sports, enjoying that yeah. is important too. And having fun. I mean, having fun. Having fun. Because life is so much of it is serious, especially what you deal with in, in your work is, you know, it's very heavy. It's and heavy. Very serious. And she's a, she's a physician and a human rights researcher. Oh, is so she she's really? either in the operating room or wow. she's Oof. dealing with, you know, victims of torture. Like yeah. her work is intense. Wow. So, so you yeah. both have very heavy careers and you're both are working parents. You, We're both, you working, both, yeah. both working parents and living in New York city. I mean, I, some, I, th I sometimes think that New York city is, a, I think it's a harder place to have children than even LA. It's a tough place. I mean, it's good for a lot of reasons, mm -hmm. but you, I mean, you're talking about jungles, like right. that's its own jungle. Yeah, it is. So yeah. How do you but, navigate that? Again, a lot of a lot of effort. I mean, I, we love living there. Where do you live? What part? On the Upper East Side. Okay. Um, and we've been there for a long time, very close to our hospital. Um, 
did I, you know, one of the, I guess to your point about having fun, it's like you can either enjoy it or you can struggle. Yeah. And I think like life is going to be a struggle regardless, yeah. like where, wherever you live, you however to, you live. You have to almost you enjoy the struggle, you know, exactly. you have exactly. to enjoy the suffering. You know, you're, not enjoy the suffering, but find meaning through the suffering. Yeah. But then counterbalance that with just lightness and play and fun. Exactly. That's important. Exactly. I mean, it would make her life better if she thought I was funny. Like, if she understood <laughs> how funny I am. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, she doesn't. She doesn't appreciate it enough. So, yeah, that would make her life better. That's so good. <laughs> and I remember you mentioning in our uh, in our pre production call this this mental health checkup you 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 had as a child. Mm, yeah. 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 Uh, tell 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 our viewers about this mental health and checkup and what in the seven spheres of life. And... Yeah, it's I mean it's it's funny to think about um, because I, I don't write about it in the book. I just brought it up when we were talking, um, but we would once a year. My my parents would get us together. My mm -hmm. my three brothers and me, um, and they would they would do a, a an annual checkup, and we would have seven spheres, and we would have to rate ourselves one to ten. And it would be like emotional, mm -hmm. spiritual, mental, intellectual, like, you know, the different aspects of our life. And then we would. So as a 10 year old, you're having to like rate yourself on the intellectual sphere of your life. Oh, my God. It was so annoying. <laughs> versus like the emotional <laughs> sphere of your life. Yeah, exactly. Versus the spiritual sphere. I guess what are the seven spheres again? Oh, my God. I'll have to remember. Um, mental, spiritual, emotional, intellectual um physical um there was one that was financial which we didn't really do until we were older and um relationships i, I don't know where, where that like what the word was for that but it was it was about a check on your relationships mm -hmm. um and i guess like thinking about it now i haven't really thought about it in a long time like part of doing it at a young age was just getting it on our radar that these are different right, kinds right. of quotients that right. you should be reflecting on. Um, and as we got older, what would happen is we would draw these out, like we would rate ourselves one to 10, and then we would actually have segments around a circle that we would fill in. Um, and then you could visualize where the imbalance was in your life. Like mm -hmm. you might be doing well in school, but you maybe weren't doing so well in your relationships. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you need to invest more. Um, a lot of times I would be like on the physical side with sports, like great. And my school stuff was not so great. <laughs> and so I, I think that was like the real underlying purpose of the whole thing was like do better at school. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I mean, it was, it was a question about balance. Like yeah. you're going to get all of these pieces in your life at all times but if you're not intentional about them, mm -hmm. then you could really easily lose sight of them. So, was, I mean, in retrospect, it was a great exercise. So now as an adult, as a father of two, where, of all those seven spheres, where is like the area where you think you need to like work on the most now? Oh, man. Um, physical is definitely one. Really? Like I'm out of shape. I'm, yeah, I haven't, <laughs> I've been running a marathon in few years Are you still um, playing soccer playing basketball more now okay i just started again okay so pandemic put a pause on that but uh -huh. i'm i'm starting again it's really fun uh and i'm not in the shape i was before so and i'm it, trying to take it easy and it also we find that as we get older you know we just like we our bodies just re don't recover oh, as yeah, yeah, yeah. Too, yeah that's so, true you know? well the good thing is i'm playing in a dad's league oh you are so okay. i'm like yeah i'm the youngest one there by far <laughs> and so we kind of like take it easy on each good, other it's good. really fun um yeah physical is definitely one um relationships is another one that i feel like i'm i'm weak on right now again uh the combination of young kids and mm -hmm. a pandemic meant yeah. like for a few and my wife is a physician working with covid patients so like for a few years i was just like mia um and now trying to reconnect with people is like it's taking me a little effort to get the momentum back and so the relationship piece feels like somewhere where i need to put more time that's important i mean just having that balance across all of those different spheres in your life it's such a challenge because something you know many times to get be, be good at one area it means 
you know, sacrificing another area, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. knowing, you know, how to best put the pieces in so that you can be balanced. Exactly. This is so, so important. Exactly. Do your parents, uh, do, are they still in San Antonio? My parents are still in San Antonio. I don't think they'll ever leave. Um, they haven't gotten their season tickets back for the Spurs yet. So oh, they hopefully haven't. they'll be good soon. <laughs> um, but yeah, when, when the Spurs, when the Spurs are winning, we find ourselves in San Antonio a lot more often. Really? And then I have two brothers in Austin. With where their are you in the line? I'm number two. Okay. So yeah. you're the second. And where are your brothers? In... I have an older and a younger brother in Austin. And uh -huh. then my youngest brother lives in Brooklyn. So near me in New York. Wonderful. I want to end with just a few, uh, final questions that we ask all of our viewers. Um, what would you say your top three healthiest habits? Top three healthiest habits. Yes. Um, the first one that's coming to mind is um, I drink my coffee black now. You do. So no cream. Do. No I cream or cream sugar. sugar. Yeah, yeah. That's so that's good. a big, that's a good change. That's good. Um, I, I'm pretty solid with um, my eating timing. Like mm -hmm. I'll stop eating usually at 6 p.m. and won't start again until 10 a.m. So I have a nice. So like a nice intermittent fasting. fasting. Yeah, fasting. pretty pretty standard. Yep. Um, walking meetings. Yeah. Instead of sitting down for yeah. lunch or a coffee, we'll, I'll tell someone, I mean, it's easy in New York. You can walk anywhere. I'll say let's let's meet at this point and yeah. or let's meet at Central Park and walk. I also think there's something about walking that almost like it makes the neurons of your brain just fire a little differently. I feel that way too. Yeah. Like I, I feel like I'm so much more I'm so much responsive. more intelligent. Yeah. I, I feel like my IQ <laughs> level goes up when I can you know talk and walk at the same yeah. time. So yeah, yeah. Okay. that's great. I it, love walking yeah. meetings. That's nice. It's a nice Yeah, it's a nice practice. I'm really enjoying that. I have a principle that says that part of balance is having healthy vices. Hmm. So what would you say are your top three healthy vices? And these are the things that are not necessarily good for you, but they bring you great joy. Okay. One is every night before I go to bed, I have my NBA like league pass on. Okay. And I'll watch okay. at least 30 minutes of basketball. I'll probably be multitasking, uh -huh. maybe doing dishes uh -huh. or you have whatever that. at the same time. But but watching basketball is a healthy vice. Um what's another one? Uh Friday mornings, uh chocolate croissant with the kids. Oh, at, that's at great. Drop -off. Really? So that's, our, so that's, that's like a ritual. Tradition. A yeah. nice oh, I love that ritual. That's so a nice one. That's yeah. nice. I'm sure they love those Friday mornings. Yeah. Oh they yeah, <laughs> we we they Every morning I get it. Is it Friday? Do we get a croissant today? So, um, yeah, that's a nice one. And then we do movie nights. Movie that's, nights. Yeah. Movie nights are Saturday nights. Pizza. That's great. Pizza and a movie with the kids. So that's also fun. Oh, that's great. It's important. Yeah. And that's also nice, too, because it's part of, even though you might consider it vices, which it's, you know, it's it just, it's rituals, you know, yeah. and having yeah. those rituals with family is so, so important. That's when you said healthy vices. Like yeah. the food we're eating is terrible. But <laughs> But there's something there's, there's something, something good about that's it, really at least. connecting. I know food is definitely a vice for me. I I am I'm a little too obsessed with it. What would you say are small things you do every single day to try to achieve balance? And I want to try uh, um, connect this with the, the Sanskrit term that I read, where you, about saha, mm, where yeah. you talk about you know this it's it's being in a spiritual state. Yeah. So what are the small things you do every day to try to achieve that state of saha yeah thanks thanks for mentioning that um so so one is a uh, is a practice of gratitude so reflecting mm -hmm. on things that i'm grateful for that day and it's it goes up and down for me but it's it's really easy actually like mm -hmm. just think of three things every day that went well that you're happy about um another one that i try and do and this one can be easier or harder depending on the day is to try and see the humanity in somebody that I'm, that I'm, that I don't know. Um, and that's, to me, that's a practice and something I've really been working on, which is trying to feel love for people that I don't know. 
that I've never met, you know, who we would otherwise call mm-hmm. a stranger. Um, so that's that's another one. Um, a third is, and this is actually quite meaningful for me every morning as I walk with the kids to school, uh, we recite the the basic sick prayers. And so I'm teaching it to them, but we're also singing it together. So there's something mm-hmm. really, I, I, I just really love that. And, and as we do it, we'll talk a little bit about the ideas and what they mean and how to practice them. That's beautiful. That's almost like a little, somewhat of like a, a walking meditation with the kids. Yeah, I mean, like in the streets of New York yeah. and <laughs> avoiding buses and taxis. Exactly. And all that, so. While dealing with the reality, you know, having these beautiful sick prayers while dealing with the realities of, yeah. of New York. Yeah, That's exactly. beautiful. Exactly. What would you say wealth means to you? Mm. I think probably wisdom is the word I would use. Um, wealth of experience, uh, wealth of insight, but also something, something that we can gain ourselves, but also something we can inherit if we, if we're open to it. It's beautiful. And I also remember reading there's in Sanskrit, there's actually a term for wisdom, but then the practice of wisdom has its own term too. Mm, Yeah. Good memory. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the word is gyan. Yeah. And the idea gyan. is, you know, we can collect as much knowledge as we want. Knowledge doesn't really do anything for us. It's right. only it's only really the implementation of, of that that becomes our wisdom. Yeah, that's really important. So always focusing to just not just on acquiring wisdom, acquiring yeah. the, the knowledge from these scholars, but then how can you actually practice that in daily life in the messiness yeah the exactly and, you know it's it's as a, as a parent i think about it in a really simple way which is my kids know what the right thing to do is but are they practicing the muscle to actually do the right thing mm-hmm. and you know i had my own experience especially in high school i knew the things that i was supposed to do and most often i wasn't doing them mm-hmm. and like i easily got off track and so what does it look like for us to get ourselves on track? I think that, that comes through practice, not through mm-hmm. ideas. Yeah, it's a muscle. It's like working out. It's like yeah. a it's a constant practice. Mm. What are the top three books you recommend, you most often recommend? Uh, okay. Um, I recommend all kinds of books to all kinds of people. Um, based on this conversation, there there are two that I love that I think might might fit you and your audience in particular um the power of now like Art Tolle, mm-hmm. and um the four agreements yep. um are two that i found to be books that i can return to over and over again and then the third one which falls within that same kind of genre although not as spiritually or- oriented and more on the practice side is a uh, Maybe cliche at this point because it's been on the bestseller list, I think, for like two years. But James Clear's Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits. Never heard of that. Oh, really? I, Great. It totally changed me as well. Wow. I mean, it's it's a really practical approach to, you know, personal transformation through mm-hmm. really small incremental changes. Wonderful. So I really love that book. Well, another book you all can get is The Light We Give. <laughs> This is a great book. Thank you. You can Thank see you. like all of like my notes. So like I actually. Oh my God. I know. This that is, is the I biggest really, compliment I really, you I really, can give to I a writer. Really, exactly. No, it's very good. I highly recommend it. Thank get you. it. When did it get, when did it, this come out? Um, July. July. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah, highly recommend it. It's a fabulous, fabulous book. Thank you. Okay. My last message, Simran. If you could put one message on a billboard to tell people how they can achieve the combination of health, wealth, and happiness at once, what would that be? Health, wealth, and happiness. Okay, there's there's this message that comes from Sixth Scripture that I share in the book at some point. I, I mean, I think it might be the one here. Um, in the original, it's Mantu Jyotsarupa Apnamu Bachan. And it means 
It's talking to the self. Hey, hey, myself, you are the embodiment of light. Like you are light. All you have to do is recognize it. And and I think that that would be the message that I would put on the billboard. Like you are, you are divine. You are light. You are Start light. living that way. You are light. All you have to do is recognize it. Yeah. Live that way. It, yeah. It's again, very simple, but sometimes that's yeah, the most sometimes profound the message. Most, exactly. That's why it's, in the, it's, it's in the simple, it's now living that you are light. Do something with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Where can people find you on social media? Oh, uh, I'm on Twitter way too much. Okay. My name's Simran on, on Twitter and then on all the other platforms. I'm sick prof. S-I-K-H-P-R-O-F. Sick prof. Okay. Sick prof. <laughs> Thank you for coming on our show. Of Thank course. you so much, fun. Sick. To my viewers and my fans, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for supporting me. I read all of your DMs. I read all of your comments. If you like this podcast, please click the like and subscribe button and the notification bells. It helps all the YouTube overlords promote this podcast to other people who are interested in balance. And I love you all. I love you all so, so much. Bye.